At what point is the private sector willing to pay to do what needs to be done in the region? We have a diet of limitations, but not a sufficient discourse on all possibilities. This is a critical step in our regional integration process. Mistrust within countries is defeating us. It's not an economic matter. That is a matter for mindset. West Indian people, we are a gem. Let's advance our partnership together through the region. Let us organize and do that together. We need to ensure that there's transparency in what we do. I do it because I love it. I'm passionate about watching things grow. If there's a will, you will find a way to make it happen. Dr. Gonzalez became the deputy political leader of the Unity Labour Party in 1994. The ULP, a merger of the St. Vincent and Grenadines Labour Party and the Movement for National Unity, a political party which, at the time of the merger, Dr. Gonzalez was the leader, won the St. Vincent and Grenadines general elections held on March 28, 2001. At the time of the elections, Dr. Gonzalez had since been elected to political lead of the ULP, and as such, he became the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines on that same date, March 28, 2001. He has remained Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines since then, winning the elections again in December 2005, and again, I think, more recently. <clears throat> Concurrently, while pursuing his political career, and prior to his becoming the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dr. Gonzalez practiced law extensively and successfully before the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court in a wide range of matters, but particularly in the fields of constitutional law, administrative law, matrimonial law, real property law, law of tort generally, and the law of contract. Dr. Gonzalez has researched, written, and published extensively on a range of matters touching upon the Caribbean, African, trade unionism, comparative political economy, and developmental issues generally. Among his two latest publications are History and the Future, a Caribbean Perspective, The Politics of Our Caribbean Civilization, Essays and Speeches, The Making of the Comrade, the political journey of Ralph Gonzales, and my personal favorite, Diary of a Prime Minister, 10 Days Among the Benedictine Monks. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, participants, I give you your friend, my friend, the Honorable Dr. Ralph E. Gonzales, Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The good thing about speaking at lunches and dinners, you can only deliver two types of speeches, bad or tolerable. I remember being asked, as I told my friends from the European Union, to speak at a dinner in Trinidad and Tobago. The Insurance Association had asked me to address a subject entitled, The Impact of the Revised Treaty of Chagaramas on Insurance Business in CARICOM. And this is after men and women had had a sumptuous meal of several courses and had imbibed a lot of wine. And just before dessert, I was asked to speak. Well, at the best of times, speaking about the impact of the revised treaty of Chagaramos and insurance business is the sort of a thing which um, a dentist may do to you as an alternative <laughs> anesthesia. 
so that on that occasion, I had to keep people awake by making a lot of jokes about my good friends, Patrick Manning, the Prime Minister, and Bas Diopande, the leader of the opposition. Unfortunately, I cannot do so here in Barbados because the wounds are still too raw <laughs> because of an election contest which we have just had in this country. Of course, having said that, I can now sit down because I would have done, I would have essentially spoken for my lunch or the way in which Mordok described me. It reminded me once I had a very bad hand as a trial lawyer in front of a magistrate in the rural, in a rural court in St. Vincent. An old man was the magistrate with a walrus moustache and a rumpled gray suit. And I had a very beautiful young lady defending on a charge of assault and battery. She had beaten another girl who had trespassed on her male friend. <laughs> and I really had no proper defense. But the, the lady had come to me the afternoon before the next day for court, and she was dressed in tight-fitting jeans and a red banlon top. I said, young lady, I have no proper defense, but tomorrow, come dress precisely like that. <laughs> and then you will see that with you, I rest my defense. <laughs> She, she was acquitted. <laughs> now, I have to, I'm told that I have to speak on embracing change. And we have to construct a new export-led framework for development. Now, you would have had a lot of very informed discussion. And there's not a great deal that I can say on this subject which you have not heard before. So if I repeat things with which you are familiar, you may well put it in the category of tolerable so that I can escape properly today. They were worried about I, if I didn't speak properly well enough, you would hiss me down. So I, I said, that's no problem. In my long years in the political wilderness, and when I started, I told them, I used to address crowds consisting of a fat woman, an old man, and a dog, with the dog being the most attentive of the three <laughs> organisms. Well, you're well fed, and I notice that you're in good spirits. So I can try to talk and avoid failure. Really, given the changes which have taken place through globalization and trade liberalization, and the advances in information technology, it's clear that the broad framework which we have to provide, not just for export-led development, but for economic advancement in the Caribbean, has to be a model which is in quest of building a modern, many-sided, competitive, post-colonial economy, which is at once national, regional and global. Every single material word in that formulation is pregnant with real meaning. 
It has to be modern. It has to be many-sided. It has to be competitive. It has to be post-colonial. It has to be national and regional and global. We can lament as much as we want the way in which we have been treated with preferences, whether in relation to bananas or sugar or rice. The fact is this, that we're in a post-colonial world. The trading relationships have, all, have been altered. And the way we make progress, as everybody here knows it, we got to produce competitively, and we have to export goods and services. And we have to produce them and export them, particularly given the fact that we have a very small internal demand. We have to produce them for people overseas. We either have to get it to the people, or we have to bring the people here and sell them, which is what the tourism linkage is about, and which is what the external market is also concerned around. Now, the export of different goods and services you have your own special set of circumstances. Whether it's manufactured goods or tourism, professional services, financial services, whether it's primary products in agriculture. Each would have its own different sets of requisites to be competitive. But in every single case, you have to produce quality, you have to produce it at a competitive price, and you have to produce it in sufficient quantities on a sustainable basis. For the marketplace, it is simple like that. It's not a complicated business. We know everything which I've said. We all of us know this. But many of us, try to hide our cells from the truth, from the facts. What we have to do, as Deng Xiaoping used to repeat, we have to get the truth from the facts and let the real world validate the truth. And that is part of his own approach to changing um, the People's Republic of China, the political economy, and more particularly the economy in the People's Republic of China. I think, though, that we often have a lamentation about our capacity. And I hear a lot of speeches as to all the reasons why we can't do things. And we in politics are very good at this. Academics are even better. Why is it that certain things can't be done? For instance, say we have a small size. In the case of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, 150 square miles. 96,000 acres of land. When you take one third away from, from it because of the land above the 1,000 foot contour, have forest reserves, and you, what remains, you take more than half of it for houses and buildings and public works of one kind, you have 20,000 acres of land remaining for agriculture. Well, that's a modest-sized farm in Ecuador. And we can all say 
What can you do with this? But there are things we can do with it. In the case of Barbados, and Barbados may not like these numbers, but they're the reality, 166 square miles. And if you multiply that by 640, because I, 640 acres I've been told since I'm a schoolboy, equal one square mile. You do the multiplication there, 166 by 640, that's 106,240 square miles. I mean acres. Not a, not a, not, not plenty land. And when you take away all the hotels and houses and public works and so on, maybe you have 20, 25, 30,000 remaining for, um, for agriculture. But you have, the agricultural land is important in Barbados, not only to produce food, but also to have a landscape, to match your seascape that tourists would want to come to, because you wouldn't want the whole place in buildings. So that's an important factor in considering when you're, when you're, when you're, you're doing your, your hotel services. We can complain about the fact that the WTO has done certain things to bananas. We can complain about um, the, in, in, in relation to to other services, like for instance financial services, what the Financial Action Task Force has done, and the, the IMF 44 recommendations and the like. We can complain about all of those things. The fact is this, in a post-colonial world, we have to come to terms with all of these matters and don't lament them. We fight certain battles, but when we recognize that we have lost certain battles, we move on to do things in order to sell our goods and services, and they're always available. Now, I would say that among our own limitations, and not just those, not just size and some of these problems, we have limitations of ourselves. We just don't work hard and smart enough. You take agriculture. I represent an agricultural constituency. A person goes to work on the farm at 8, 8.30. He picks up, when he arrives on the farm, he and two other workers, each has his file to file his cutlass. But no, they don't file while they're waiting to get a ride to go on the farm. They wait until they get on the farm. And because they have a comradely association, all three or four of them would have to file their cutlass seriatim. They can't file one and then go and work. Everybody has to. And then... You work for two and a half, three hours, and you call that a day. Happens, happens in Jamaica, it happens in St. Vincent, it, it happens all about. No, it, you, you can't, you cannot produce anything there for export, which is competitive, or even for consumption locally. Because the price of yams and dasheen and tanias and edos are more expensive than flour and rice. Yes. So when people say we must buy local, I say of course we must buy local. But if a mother has three children to feed, what are you going to do? You're going to buy a pong of farine for $8 Eastern Caribbean when you can buy a pong of rice, which is $1.30 Eastern Caribbean. 
These are the problems you have. Or when buying half a breadfruit is more expensive than two pounds of rice, and so on and so forth. I, I, but that's agriculture. But the similar problems of labor and management productivity exist in the manufacturing sector, in the hotel sector, and I'm not just saying labor, I'm talking about management productivity also. The truth is that too few people in our Caribbean today have to carry too many. And I'm not talking here about those who are seeking jobs and can't get jobs. I'm talking about people who are working. And we have to get it in our heads that a progressive society is a society which has hard, smart, and productive work at its core. But that's not what we have. In this Caribbean, there's a trend, and it is increasing. When we watch the television and the MTV shows and, and all the rest of it, there is a focus on leisure, pleasure, and nice time by too many people. But a society which is preoccupied with leisure, pleasure, and nice time will go the way of Rome, of the Caesars. I repeat, we have to work hard, smart, and productively. I can, I can read off a lot of things, what we can possibly do in the export sector. And I, I have a list I can, but I am, I'm addressing some fundamental things. And then a limitation in our society is crime. You can have all the tax incentives. You can do the productive work. You can do all sorts of things. But if as I see out of Trinidad and Tobago in the newspapers, that you have a detection rate of 12% for serious crimes. It's a joke. And we have, we're spending a lot of money on tourism. And I heard I was talking to a camera lady just now. She said she has to rush off because she has to go and take photographs of the two people who shoot or beat up two tourists in Barbados or something like that. This business of development and the model which we are having has to start from our families and come all the way through. This is not a quick fix. And anybody who believes this is a quick fix, um, they, they, they would have a rude awakening. However, I don't want to just talk about our limitations. That's only part of the story. I want to read here, because there are many other limitations. I want to read here what I've put down. We possess two immense possibilities and strengths. Otherwise, if we don't believe this, we leave this place, these places, as, um, as George Schultz had said it at the time of the Grenada invasion, it's a nice piece of real estate. Or we just consider it a nice piece of real estate. But we are a functioning civilization. We have strengths, we have possibilities. Among these are the following. Fertile land and an abundance of fresh water. 
a landscape and seascape of exquisite and even unique beauty, substantial marine resources, a wonderful climate practically all year round, the presence of energy resources of hydro, geothermal, wind, and solar. In the case of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and this is an important thing, matter for everybody outside of Trinidad and Tobago where you have cheap energy in Trinidad, um, I expect within the next 10 years, we are going to be 90% um, green. We, we, we are 20% we are, we are, we are hydro at the moment. We are doing some solar. We are doing a little wind. But, but um, geothermal is going to be the, the, the major game changer, which would reduce the cost of electricity by at least 50%. And once you can have that, because you need cheap electricity for your production of goods and services and reliable, at least competitively priced electricity. Despite the fact that we have a number of lazy people, we nevertheless have, incidentally, I speak like this in the country and in St. Vincent Grenadines, and I've won three elections. Don't think that I am only talking like this outside of, I talk like this at home. Of course, for you to talk like that, you had to work real hard. They had to see me reaching at my office at 7.30, the latest, and I had to be the last man going home, which means you have to have a tolerant wife. And you would have to or at least you reach a particular stage in your life where what you are good at is to sing precious memories. <laughs> um, so we have an ambitious, resilient, and largely hardworking people steeped in the tried and tested values of our Caribbean civilization. An educated labor force which is easily trainable. A productive labor force whenever it is structured within a rewarding and uplifting social organization of labor. A patriotic domestic private sector. You know, one of the amazing things is this. The private sector, and I've done it part in my own life, but the more I see the private sector and talk to them, overwhelmingly they are patriotic. Overwhelmingly they love their country and they want to do good for it. In the early years, some of us, we were too we made some facile assumptions about them. And of course, in every group, you'll have one or two who are not concerned about their country. But we have a patriotic domestic private sector, which is far more so than in several other parts of the world. We have a people for whom English is their first language. It's an important possibility. We are located close to the world's largest economy, which is not to be sneezed at. We have a people, by and large, who are God-fearing, good-natured, tolerant, peaceful, and law-abiding. We have the beneficiaries of significant net migration because they take some pressure off and they provide a market overseas and they send home money. A committed diaspora overseas, a nation of laws, constitutionalism, good governance, and popular unity. A public administration system which, despite its many weaknesses, is basically sound, efficient, and effective. A land of liberty and democracy. A commitment to family life and just economic rewards for labor. The instruments of sovereignty and independence 
to be utilized as principled assets in the people's interests. Sometimes you don't see those as assets, but they are assets for us to utilize. Our ability to attract annually at least a modest level of foreign direct investment. Between 2008, 9, 10, 11, those four years, we attracted to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. According to the data, we have 495 million US dollars worth of foreign direct investment, which for an economy which is about 800 million US dollar GDP per year, that's not bad. In fact, that's pretty okay. But we have to do a lot of other things. Possibility for us is for us to embrace unequivocally the deepening of regional integration amidst all its challenges and the profound sense of international solidarity between like-minded nations, groups, and peoples. And something which is an asset, which we have as a possibility, is the delivery of quality political leadership. Now, I decided, having spoken about limitations, to talk about our possibilities, because I've read several speeches, and I was discussing this with Ron Sanders, say that I find we have a diet of limitations, but not a sufficient discourse on our possibilities. Because when we have the discourses only connected to limitations, we end up with a kind of learned helplessness. We, we, we are very authoritative in our, in our pronouncements on our limitations, but at the end of the day, you leave with a sense of helplessness. I don't think we should leave here with a sense of helplessness. We have challenges, we have difficulties, but there are all these possibilities. I've, I will summarize some of the things I've been talking about here. What we need for the export of goods and services. Production of quality goods and services for export market. The availability of competitively priced skilled labor and management. The utilization of appropriate modern technology. It's amazing some of the technologies which we still use in our businesses. It's completely outdated. We need the provision of reliable, competitively priced electricity, water, and telecommunication services. You can't make any money if your electricity bill is too high. The fact. Or if the unit cost of your labor comparatively is too high. The elaboration of a regime of tax incentives to facilitate the production and export of goods and services. For instance, our, tap, our, our top tax rate in St. Vincent and Grandines is 32.5%. But if you export to CARICOM, that portion of what you produce is 25%. If you sell extra regionally, sorry, 25% is if you sell extra regionally. If you sell to CARICOM, is 20%. And if you sell to the OECS, is 15%. So we have a, a tax regime in a way to encourage the export of goods and services. Now, it doesn't have to be done like that. You can use other numbers, but you can mount the particular kind of tax regime to facilitate the production and export of goods and services. We have to ha provide good physical infrastructure, including airports, seaports, roads, which are fit for the purpose. I notice that Jamaica is going on. I, see, I read the proposals by the Prime Minister to take advantage of what is happening in Panama, to have a massive port development. If that happens, that would be fantastic. We, 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 we are going to move our port from where it's located to, to the western end of the city, to modernize it and everything, because we ourselves have to take advantage, obviously in a lesser way than Jamaica, but, but nevertheless, we have to do that. The collaboration in the regional production and marketing of, and, of goods and services for export. 
the production of export of quality goods which are linked to our own raw materials to the extent that's possible, but also for the manufacture of niche products with externally sourced raw materials. Applied modern science and technology are vital here, for instance, in the production of pharmaceutical and IT products. The production of quality services for exports, including tourism, entertainment, and the creative arts, financial services, and professional services. Each of these areas, of course, as I've said, you have to have a more focused attention. But you take entertainment services. We are now, we have signed the EPA. And in the case of the OECS countries, and I know it exists already for Barbados and Antigua and St. Kitts, you don't need any visas. You have Schengen visa waivers. We have to really and, and that's on the card for the rest of us in the OECS, which helps greatly if you can go. Let's take one of the sleepier places in, 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 in Europe, Belgium. I'm told that there are 63 music festivals in the year. 63. Can you imagine if we can access some of that? And we're not talking about Britain or Germany or France, where they're much larger. Efficiencies in government, we have to, really, we take, we take too long to do too many things in government. And we have the capacity to do better. And they restrict us in our, in our uh, economic development. And then, of course, the facilitation of access to a sufficiency of capital for export industries, particularly to regional and international financial institutions. Well, I understand that um, the president of the CDB is going to talk tomorrow about accessing monies. The availability of competitively priced air and sea transport, I don't just understand for the life of me. Why Carl and Liat can't work out their, their difficulties? I mean, I just don't understand. And I'm chairman of the shareholders of Liat for the last 12 years. It was easier for me to take on Stanford and defeat him with Caribbean Star than to make progress with Cal. I'm telling you. It seems as though anybody, and, and I may be reported on this, but it seems as though that anybody who takes on Cal to run it, whether in whichever government in Trinidad and Tobago, something happens to them. I just don't, I don't, I don't understand it. Um, but we ought not to have this problem. And, and, and um, of course, shipping. And we have to deliver better security than we have done. So, my message is very simple. We have a lot of possibilities. We have some limitations. We can get things done. But we have to look at the facts as we are, and we have to build a modern, competitive, many-sided, post-colonial economy, which is national, regional, and global. Now, if I were writing a paper as an academic, what I've just spoken here, I could write a hundred pages but it basically would have ended up with the story that I've spoken over the last 12 and a half minutes. Thank you very much.